So, hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I'm delighted to talk to Sheikh Azra Rashid. You're most welcome, sir. Ahlan wa sahlan. Salaam alaikum, sir. Salama. Good to meet you. We're here in Birmingham in his uh, amazing mosque, this beautiful building. Sheikh uh, Azra is a scholar who currently lives here in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. He began his studies here and later moving to Damascus uh, to study. He's a teacher of Islamic studies, but continues to pursue his knowledge on Islamic fiqh, Aqidah and other contemporary issues. He's the author of a very well-researched and well-written book called, this is it, Islam Answers Atheism. There you are, I do recommend it. And he has kindly agreed to discuss themes arising from this book today. So, um, Sheikh, can I first um, ask you, why did you feel the need to write this book? So, through uh, multiple engagements with young Muslims <coughs> within the university campuses and the Masajid across the UK, mm. many questions were presented to me. Doubts regarding Islam, doubts regarding the Quran, doubts regarding the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, I would respond to these objections, sometimes finding a written response in classical literature, sometimes not finding an adequate response, the need mm. to formulate a response. Mm. And over time, you can say, in my mind, the book was devised over a right. period of time. Right. So the chapters, as, as they were divided, they for formulated in my mind how the arguments should be set up so mm, even in a mm. simple pre presentation, someone would ask regarding the problem of evil, right. eternal punishment in hell. And at that time, a decade ago, mm. there was not sufficient literature or sufficient uh, media videos or mm. uh, responses from the Muslims with regard to these things. So over time, the, the book was formulated in my mind. And then during the period of lockdown, I found uh -huh. During the mm. COVID lockdowns, I yeah. found time, sufficient time mm. to simply ju just jot down mm. my thoughts. So mm. the book mm. is a produce of my thoughts. Excellent. So a long gestation period that, um, and COVID, that COVID lockdown period was a catalyst for many people, including myself, to, to begin new projects. Mm. But um, recently I, I looked on Google for the, uh, the top most common atheist arguments. And I came <laughs> across uh, these six arguments which for some people um, are good reasons for rejecting faith. And you discuss these in considerable detail uh, in your book, Islam Answers Atheism, but perhaps we can discuss them now. And the, the first um, common objection that I, I've come across is sim the simple statement that there is no evidence for God's existence. And this is seen as a reason for atheism. How would you respond to that so claim? That claim would fall into a simple rejection of what we know as al-fitrah, which is the mm. natural disposition of man. If someone was on a, an aeroplane that was nose diving, they would automatically refer to a god. They would say, oh god. Mm. And that entails that there is a natural disposition within all creatures to what to what we know as rububiyah. Rububiyah is that there is someone who has created us and nurtures us at every point of our lives. Mm. Like your journey mm. from London till now, mm. That journey, you may have done your necessary steps, and but at the same time, there is a spiritual aspect to every journey. And that's just a simple journey from London to Birmingham. The journey of life, there is a human, innate, primordial, innate nature within us that tells <coughs> us with regard to someone overlooking our mm -hmm. affairs right. from childhood mm -hmm. to growth in adulthood. And... To reject that is the very essence of kufr because linguistically the word kufr means to cover. Mm, so mm. the farmer, he places a seed into the ground and covers the seed, he's referred to as kafir. Yes. yes. And uh, the night is referred to as kafir because the night covers everything. Right. So the kufr in, by essence <clears throat> is the covering of our internal nature, our, our natural state, our fitra. Secondly, the claim that there is no sufficient argument these arguments, you have the Kalam cosmological argument popularized now. You mm. have the teleological argument, you have the design argument, all these various arguments. Yeah. You mm. have the counter arguments. What I would say is that the counter arguments have not sufficiently demolished any single 
valid argument. So the, the point being that if the arguments have not been sufficiently dismantled, a cumulative argument is all of these arguments, when you look at them combined, mm. would lead to absolute certainty. Right. And that's just in terms of rational mm. thinking. Mm. So, mm. Th for instance, the Kalam cosmological argument has not been sufficiently refuted to the point that they can say they, they've demolished the, the argument and demonstrated its mm. invalidity, that the argument is totally invalid. The argument still stands. If you add to that the teleological argument, the design argument, and various other arguments, mm. all of these arguments combined would lead to absolute certainty. Right. And then you have the, the barometer of uh, Richard Dawkins, the seven levels of certainty that there is no God. He says even he is not on a level seven. Absolute certainty. So he's not absolutely certain. He, he has no absolute certainty. So he can't prove it with that kind of uh, absolute certainty. But you mentioned the Kalam cosmological argument. And of course, even prominent Christian philosophers in the West, like Professor William Lane Craig, have been uh, the most popularist kind of exponent of this in the West. But are you able just to tell us briefly what the Kalam cosmological argument actually is, without so, going perhaps into all the complexities? So the, the, the Kalam cosmological mm. argument is simply demonstrating the non regression of uh, those things which we refer to as hawadith. Hawadith are anything that comes into existence after non-existence, anything which has an accidental nature. You cannot have a continuous regress of anything which is contingent by nature. Right. So you reach a point where the cause of everything contingent must be self-sufficient. So the, the, the cause of everything in, in the universe is, is contingent, it's not necessary, it's not eternal, because everything that came to be must have a cause, is that right? Everything that came yes, into existence must have a cause. by its very nature, by, by observation, right. everything <clears throat> in the universe is contingent, accidental, right. it came into existence. They attempt to counter this argument by saying, you only observe an aspect of the universe, how do you know the rest of the universe is not eternal? Mm. Which is absurd because I mentioned in the book also, in order to simplify this, the universe is either still or mov moving. Mm. And both of these are, very, uh, are, are the very nature of contingent things, to be still or to move. Something eternal is not described as being moving or being still at the same time. Or, or, or uh, paradoxically, both at the same time, it, mm. cannot be, it cannot be moving, it cannot be still. Because stillness and movement is the very nature of contingent things. Those mm. things which are contained by a void or time and direction and uh, spatial location, anything which is in spatial location yeah. contained by six directions, right. it cannot be eternal. Now, but, but why can't it be eternal? Why can't you have an infinite regress? So you have uh, one contingent thing uh, caused by another contingent thing caused by another infinite uh, contingent thing ad infinitum. What, but you, you said that's not possible. So why is an infinite regress, as it's sometimes called, not coherent? Why is it logically impossible in your view? Because you could just have an, an eternal universe without a cause, an ultimate cause, perhaps. Because essentially anything which is uh, contingent in nature would have to go out of existence. Right. And that which sustains those things which go out of existence needs to have self-sufficiency. If it's not self-sufficient, oh, right. then those things that it produces will go out of existence and the sustainability is totally impossible. Right. The, it, to sustain such a uh, continuous chain would be totally impossible. Mm. And that's what the Kalam mm. cosmological argument demonstrates, that the continuation of... So Craig, he gives examples of an eternal library, mm. that uh, he gives a, a mental... Uh, thought experiment. Thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. And he demonstrates through thought experiments that it's impossible to have it. You can reframe or restructure this argument in many ways. So mm. I've given the seven principles. If you remember in the chapter, on the, yeah, in the in, third in, chapter, in the book, yeah. there is the seven principles <clears throat> that uh, something eternal mm. cannot have conting a contingent nature mm. by essence. Mm. Because everything has something additional to itself. So you can never conceive of something without an attribute. So if I told you to conceive mentally something without an attribute, you cannot... So if you thought of, let's say, mm. a hollow circle, mm. the hollow circle still has an attribute of being a circle, yeah. of being hollow. Mm. 
Mm. Similarly, a rock mm. with no attribute, it, it still will have an attribute. Yeah. So everything has something additional to itself, which is contingent and accidental. Now, if it has something additional to itself, that additional thing is contingent by nature, if you, if you think of it like this. And then that contingent nature is non-transferable. So you cannot say the circleness of a circle will transfer itself to a square mm. and make the square a circle. So it's non-transferable. And therefore, it's essential to that thing. And being essential to that thing would entail... And by the way, they refer to this, uh, the atheists, when I debate them, they refer to this as mental gymnastics. So they say all this mental gymnastics is unnecessary. So if we avoid all this mental gymnastics, they say by default, my position is what is skepticism by default. The claim is, the, the counterclaim to all of these arguments is that the, the default state of someone is skepticism. So skepticism is the natural state. This is what they claim. Which is all because it's not, <clears throat> it's not obvious to me that skepticism is the default natural state. What, what, why should skepticism be that? Uh, you mentioned the fitra, the natural state is the it disposition be. to believe in God and transcendence and so on. All, all mm. ancient civilizations, Amazonian mm. people mm. and others, they all demonstrate that the natural state of man is to believe mm. in mm. a transcendent <clears throat> God, if they like using the word God. There was a survey done recently at Oxford, I seem to remember, where the researchers looked at a whole range of different contemporary cultures, including very secular cultures like Japan and uh, South Korea and so on. And they found that children, uh, very young children everywhere, had this instinctive belief, regardless of how they were brought up, whether they were brought up in a secular home or a religious home, they all, they all, they all witnessed to this belief. So th this seems to be empirical evidence that is actually an innate disposition and not instilled in children by the society or their upbringing or their parents. It's not. It's just part of the DNA, if you like. I don't mean literally DNA, I don't know. But the, the metaphorical DNA of our species. We, we are believing creatures, as, as you say. So <clears throat> what they attempt to do now is by dismissing these arguments, what they do is they dismiss all these arguments and they go on to the default <clears throat> position, which is uh, skepticism is the default position and mm. you need to demonstrate to me that God exists. Mm. Now the problem with this is that it's subjective because the, you will meet atheists if you say to them if God wrote on, in the sky that I, God exists through yeah. stars for you, would you believe? They no. say no, it could be a figment of exactly. my imagination. So now c convincing <clears throat> a specific individual is subjective <clears throat> to that individual. It's a denial of, ob of objective truth. Mm, mm. What in Islamic uh, kalam they refer to as nafsul amr, uh, real objective reality, meaning that which exists. So uh, claiming skepticism is the natural default step, uh, the d default state mm. is, th mm. is a way of avoiding the entire argument. So you can pre present all these arguments mm. and the counterattack will be uh, will be incapable of rendering those arguments uh, as faulty, but at the same time they will say, I'm a skeptic, you need to present one evidence that will convince me. I often find that atheists are very skeptical, are very selective in their, in their epistemological skepticism. So they'll <clears throat> they direct their skepticism to, towards God on this question, but on other fundamental um, uh, a priori beliefs, uh, I beliefs we have prior to experiencing reality, like the even the existence of the world, for example, or the existence of other minds, independent of our own minds, um, they're not sceptical. They just take this as given, even though it's very difficult to prove that the external world exists uh, uh, other than just pointing at it, because, because it could be an illusion. It might just be a product of our own minds. How do you prove that it exists separate from just pointing at it? And if they were to employ this scepticism to other cognitive faculties they have and other epistemologies, they wouldn't be able to do science. They wouldn't be able to, to go about their daily lives. So I think their scepticism is very, lim is, is very selective and focused on one particular thing. But in other areas, they just trust that reality is as it is. They trust that, that the universe is ordered. They trust that other minds exist. They trust, they trust, they trust. What they do is an so, ad hoc... As ad hoc, uh, ad exactly. Hoc, uh, um, <clears throat> They redesign their mm. arguments every time they encounter something that can violate their ah, right. uh, preconceptions. So, for instance, you, mm. if you remember when I mentioned the 
underlying materialistic philosophies that mm. underlie new atheism. Mm. So there was a utilitarianism. It's there, but the new atheists wouldn't know where to start with utilitarianism, where, where it begins and where it ends, mm. selectively choosing different aspects of uh, philosophy. So mm. we as Muslims <clears throat> would be described <clears throat> as realists. Mm. We believe in yeah. haqaiq al-ashya. So the, the Muslim theologians say haqaiq al-ashya ithabitatun. The realities of things are established. So we don't fall into uh, the Greek, mm. uh, you know, the, the, the Greek uh, skeptics, the various schools that they had. Mm. They, they had so many different schools that some of them denied reality, material yes. reality. Well, that's where it came from, the ancient Greeks. It's not all of them, of course. I don't think Plato was a skeptic, but there were skeptic uh, philosophers there. And that, in the West, I think that's where the, the virus, if you like, began in ancient Greek philosophy two and, and a half thousand years ago. passed down to David Hume. And passed down to David Hume, who, who I'm going to quote in a minute, actually. And so, you know, this is not a, it's a peculiarly Western virus, I think, that goes back to the ancient Greeks. Yeah. Very strange. Um, that school, <clears throat> the, the ancient Greek school, is covered in classical Islamic theology where they refute all these various Greek philosophers mm. and the mm. types of schools. I've listed those uh, types of schools in chapter 3. Right. Good. Well, we have, we have to read that to find out more. So the, the next um, uh, claim made by uh, atheists in my uh, six arguments, uh, which I came across why some people... I uh, think there are good reasons for rejecting faith, I, I, is this. If God created the universe, who created God? Um, and uh, on my own Twitter feed, I, I've got atheist who says, if God created the universe, who created God? Then me, I says, if a baker baked a cake, then who baked the baker? It's a kind of a, minim, a very quick repost. But, but the question is often asked, you know, who, okay, God created the universe, so who made God? And I think there's a, a, a straightforward answer to that. But w what have you said about it? <clears throat> Classically speaking, they respond to that by mentioning the impossibility of what is known as, known as a tasalsul, which is continuous regress. Mm. So the continuous regress of contingent things is, they demonstrate its impossibility. Mm. And that demonstration is done through thought experiments, where they mention various examples of why an, a regress of contingence is impossible and therefore it must stop at a point where someone self-sufficient has caused right. the chain of events right. and that someone self-sufficient must be ascribed with x y and z attributes like omniscience and mm. omnipotence mm. and all these other attributes mm. secondly the this type of questioning falls into the the fallacies which you will be surprised tend to convince some people mm. one of those fallacies is got capable of creating a boulder so huge mm. that then he himself cannot lift the boulder which in itself is uh, is a tana the question is a uh, what we refer to as tanaqud an internal contradiction in essence the questioner is asking can god make himself powerless mm. can he remove <coughs> his <coughs> omnipotence mm. and be unable to lift mm. a boulder that he has created which himself? is absurd it's an it's absurdity, absurdity. Yeah. This is like asking the question, can you write, can you write with a sword? Mm. The answer is the function of a sword is different to the function of a pen. Mm. So when you refer to the cause of the universe, the cause of the universe must be eternal self-subsistent in the first place. Right. To claim that the eternal self-subsistent cause has a cause is a contradicting question. And you're just left with the, the, the further question of who created that cause, and you haven't really come to the end of Meaning the, it's a fallacy. And then, it's a fallacy. As you yeah. know that mm. we go into the, uh, the question of the, uh, the universe, when if we say the universe is caused, then they say, how do you know another universe, mega mm. universe, they don't create the current universe. You just go back one step into the same yeah. question. Yeah. And yeah. surprisingly, this these fallacious type of arguments are convincing people. Mm. 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 Wow. Okay. Well, the, the next uh, um, claim I think is probably the most um, common uh, I've come across anyway. And um, there are various ways of putting it. So I'll, I'll read a quote also from David Hume here. Um, a God who allows so much suffering and death can be nothing but evil. This is the claim. In other words, if God exists and he created the world, why would he allow uh, so much evil to happen? And in his famous book, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, published in 1779, David Hume, the famous Scottish uh, Enlightenment philosopher, he says, and I quote, 
Epicurus's old questions are yet unanswered. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? Unquote. So this is a very old When conundrum. they tend to quote David Hume, if you know from the book mm. itself, it's actually a play. And that's actually one of the characters. A dialogue, isn't it? Between has, yeah. Theos yeah. and whoever yeah. the characters right. are. Yeah. It's actually a dialogue. So it's uh, potentially, mm. it's not even the position of Hume. Potentially. It's, it's, yeah. it's a character within, because the counter response is also given. Mm. Mm. And if you remember in the dialogues, one of the characters, I think the theist, he walks out the library mm. in midway. He walks out and then the other two continue their discussion. So <clears throat> the question here, again, the very definition of evil. What is evil? Mm. Evil is subjective. Yeah. For a snake, the poison mm. in the snake is not evil. But for the victim, the poison is evil. So for the snake, the poison is good. A one-way street is bad for the drivers, but good for the government. So it's subjective. Mm, mm. And similarly, another definition of evil would be um, uh, what we say, tasarruf fi milkil ghayr, which means doing, taking things from the property of someone else. But if we all belong to Allah, then how can there be any evil? Meaning he takes your life, he takes my life. Right. It's, it's not an evil being ascribed <clears throat> to Allah. Mm, mm. Similarly, <clears throat> if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to place everyone in hellfire, despite their obedience, it cannot be described as being evil because he does what he wills. That's why the Quran says, فَعَالُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ The do of what he wills. So in contradistinction to Christian theology, when they say God is all good, Mm. And what all good may entail, in Islam we have sifatul af'al. What are sifatul af'al? The attributes of the divine actions. He can be ascribed with the opposites. So he's al-muhyi, the one who gives life, but he is also al-mumit, the one who gives death. He is al-rahman, but he is also al-muntaqim. So can you translate what rahman means? Al-rahman, and... the merciful, right. and al-muntaqim, the one who, who punishes. Right. So he can be ascribed with those opposites. These are known as sifatul af'al, <clears throat> the divine attributes of the, div uh, the actions of Allah. So death is from the actions of Allah. He takes away life. But then there is also wisdom in his divine actions. So uh, the wisdom, some people may not be able to fathom the wisdom. So right. they question the divine actions. Right. But for instance, if we had no imperfections in our lives and the world was a perfect place, at the time of death, we would not want to leave this world. Mm, mm. We would find it difficult to leave because we're leaving a perfect world. But when we have uh, interactions with other human beings or with the world and the life that we live that are distasteful, we realize this world is temporary. So when we leave, death becomes easy for us. Mm. That's just one wisdom. Mm. But there are multiple <clears throat> wisdoms of Allah, like the earthquake that happened in Turkey recently. For the children, it's a mercy, they go back to their Lord. For the sinner, it's a punishment because he's punished for his sins. Mm. So the wisdom of Allah is so diversified that <clears throat> you, the human mind can account for some of that wisdom or reach a conclusion with regard to some of that mm. wisdom. And then also within this objection is the claim of free will, the human free will. Or was it with regard to the action of Allah? that he is able to stop people from, right. prevent people from. And if he doesn't, then he's either impotent or he's evil or something. Yeah. So the response to that would mm. be the full picture. Right. The full picture will be displayed on the Day of Judgment. Right. I think that Hamza also sometimes says, we've got the pixel, but we don't have the whole, the whole movies. No, we've only got a part of the story. We don't know the whole holistic reality. So, so the behind Qiyam, the scenes. Yom al Qiyam, the Day of Judgment. Day, yes. We can't see the unseen. And the, uh, there's some amazing passages in the Quran that talk about. And sometimes this, yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out the, the mm. wisdom. 
Right. For the makhluk, for the creation mm. to see and witness. I, th I think that this problem mostly is a bigger problem, far more bigger problem for Christians. Now, I'm not saying this to be polemical. This is just my honest experience. I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Justin Welby, being asked about this kind of issue uh, several years ago. And, and, you know, he's a very learned man. He's a caring man and so on. But he didn't have an answer. And he said, well, we just don't know. I mean, that was that was all he said. Um, and, you know, you talk about many strands of wisdom in the Islamic perspective uh, and, and this kind of uh, v v very comprehensive w way of understanding it, but it's largely missing from the Christian response. And I think that's where Hume is coming from. He, he is, if this does represent his view, of course. And is, Stephen he, Fry also. Yes, yes. So, because, because for them, death is just evil. But in Islamic tradition, it's not because God creates death and this world is temporary and this life is a trial anyway. It's not, our, not meant to be a bed of roses where everything is. And also the conception of God in Christianity is often he's just love. He's just a loving God. It's like a benign grandfather who just wants to give us sweets and nice things and blessings all the time. That's completely un-Islamic. Uh, yeah. And you said there's, there are different um, attributes, attributes and yes, names exactly. of Allah. Um, and you mentioned the Rahman, you mentioned the, the opposite and so on. Um, uh, and so it's a much more credible, I think, persuasive response. And I, again, I'm not saying that because I'm biased, but I think it really is a more Ultimately, effective response. Ultimately, what the question comes down to is what we refer to as a ubudiyah servitude to Allah. The Muslim is the one who submits to Allah mm. and recognizes his innate neediness to Allah, right. which is referred to as ubudiyah. Rejection of that and covering that is kufr. Mm, mm. So questioning the, the divine actions, the divine will, <clears throat> is the essence of kufr. Yeah. But accepting the divine will is the essence of belief. Mm, mm. Gosh, okay. Well, that, that's fascinating. Thank you. The next one, number four, um, is, uh, again, this is a fascinating question, but I think there are uh, some responses. Evolution, it is claimed, has answered the question of where we came from. There is no need for ignorant ancient myths anymore. And I'm quoting here from uh, a typical atheist um, website. So um, this is a very common objection. I think it, based on a misunderstanding, but could you perhaps address that about evolution? Again, uh, the placing of evolution theory as a demonstrable fact that can never be refuted is false. Mm, mm, mm. Evolution theory in our epistemology, where would we place it? Would we place it in absolute certainty? The answer is no. It's a hypothesis that fulfills the explanation of it within a certain framework. Mm. So adaptation and different aspects of evolution, they are scientifically proven, meaning observable. But the core essence is, as he refers to as a, the creation myth, would be the creation of Adam yeah. salam, and Hawa salam. That has not been disproven through any empirical science. Mm, mm. Because as you would know, every so often anthropologists or uh, archaeologists, when they find some remains, the entire picture changes by 100,000 yeah, and yeah. 200,000 years. Yeah. So it's within our uh, framework, our paradigm of placing knowledge. Where do we place this type of knowledge? It would be it would not be absolute certainty. It would, it would not be near certainty. It would be st still in the in the middle area. So mm. Some things would mm. be deemed as factual, provable, observable, but some things are still the in going through the uh, th theoretical stages. And even Dawkins himself states that in a hundred years from now, the Darwinian evolution theory would be totally unrecognizable, meaning that mm. what would replace the current framework <clears throat> would be <clears throat> unrecognizable in a hundred years. Why? Because of the advance of science and that's how science works. Yeah. Science undergoes paradigm shifts yes. when it reaches a cumulative uh, or a, a point of uh, change, meaning where it needs to shift. I think it's a really important point because the, the, the assumption that where we're at now in, in our science in, in the West or wherever is the, is the end of the story. We now know it all. Is It goes against all our understanding of the history of science where, we, as you say, we have paradigm shifts. This is an expression invented by Thomas Kuhn, wasn't Thomas it? Kuhn, yes. The structure of scientific revolutions. Yes. An amazing work written in the 1980s, I think. Um, so we, we know, I've actually got a, a book at home written by a professor of physics at King's College in London. It was published in 1899. And in this book, a very dusty old thick book, he confidently asserts, this professor of physics, 
that we now know all there is to know about physics. This is 1899. But in 1907, a certain man called Einstein came along, yeah. um, his patents clerk in Switzerland, and revolutionized the whole of physics, introducing general theory of relativity and so on. So th this confident assertion of this King's College professor was completely mistaken. Um, and the lesson there we need to learn is, is that this is always changing. And so your quote, ironically, from you agreeing um, with um, Thomas uh, the, the atheist uh, oh, yeah. scientist uh, earlier, um, who um, said that the future understanding of evolution quantum could, be completely, gravity could be completely may, different. Quantum gravity and the research on quantum gravity may mm. even replace relativity now. Uh, right. Meaning physicists will know about the new research being done and yeah. what will replace Einstein's relativity. So the Quran cannot be reinterpreted mm. in accordance with whatever new discoveries are being made. Mm. The Quran, in our Kalam epistemology, we simply designate a place for the, the knowledge. Where does that knowledge fall into? Is it absolute certainty? Right. If it's absolute certainty, it will never disagree with the Quran. Right. The Quran doesn't clash with empirical fact. But is it the case that we need to know where there is a problem potentially and where there isn't? So the Quran, uh, I, I may be wrong, so correct me if I, I'm wrong, doesn't speak to the issue of the evolution or non-evolution of animal species. So w would that be, be a case of it doesn't really, it's often no, no theological significance, but it does speak directly, as you've already alluded to, to the special creation of this original human pair, Adam and Eve, as we say in English. So there are some things that are not an issue, whether or not they're true, they may or may not be true, so evolution for animal species, but there is a red line or ring fence around yes. some things. So which there's a we consensus on yeah. Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam being specifically individually created, yeah. but we as Muslim theologians would say it's a challenge for scientists to disprove that which they have not lived up to and they will never be able to live up to. Why? Because our claim is that the Quran, empirical facts that are stated in the Quran categorically, I mean, they can never be disproven scientifically. Mm -hmm. And the word scientifically, what I mean by that is empirically uh, factual, not uh, theoretically that they yeah. fall into. So a, th a model may work for a certain criteria. It may mm. uh, evolution works in certain aspects of medicine. Right. Uh, evolution works in certain fields of science. But then the application of evolution in everything in, in everything. life, from right. how uh, uh, communists after the Bolshevik revolution misused uh, the Darwinian evolutionary mm. theory, how mm. they applied that even to political science how they applied that to our mousy tongue may have applied uh, Darwinian evolution to politics. And, and the Nazis, of course, uh, developed this idea of social Darwinism yes. in terms of the, the struggle between you know, re human races yes. and the extermination Superior of some races. races. Yes. Yes. So it, it can be weaponized even, even by the Nazis. Yes. And uh, this falls into the uh, deeming science as, uh, as uh, where science is now governing humankind and humankind mm, is mm. not governing science. Mm. The, the machine, the, the construction of a machine that governs humans mm. and humans do not govern science. That's the distinction between, and I would like to mention Richard Dawkins saying, oh, the Muslims, they do not even have, uh, they may have one person who has won the, uh, the uh, Nobel uh, Prize, the Nobel Peace mm. Prize, which is a contradiction Nobel Peace Prize for a man who created dy dynamite. Yeah, but he was trying to atone for his uh, sins by creating a peace prize. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, mm. uh, as if to say our progress is determined by a creation of a, of a Western scientist, mm. Uh, mm. meaning he will determine for us how intellectually advanced we are, mm. meaning how many Nobel Peace Prizes we win in determines how intellectually advanced we are, when in reality Islam is not a result of our intellectual endeavors. Islam is a revelation. It guides us ethically with regard to science, mm. how to uh, look at the world post-1945, the, uh, the development of nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, the the Manhattan Project and how scientists created the nuclear weapons and Einstein was involved in that uh, even though he may have regretted that after yeah. uh, post 1945 you have uh, the world more 
uh, as a machine, the world is governed as a machine because of scientists, not because of religion. Mm. So it's a blessing <clears throat> that the caliphate was abolished. It's a blessing in disguise. It was abolished because we have a world now that has uh, Agent Orange and Napalm and uh, so many disgusting, uh, horrific weapons that are utilized on civilian populations. Mm. All of this, the produce of science. Unguided science, yeah, unethical yeah. science. So yeah. where will we get our ethics from? Mm -hmm. Gosh, okay, let's open a can of worms. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the next question, um, I think is the most interesting, uh, not question, the, the, uh, the reason some people think uh, uh, there are good reasons for rejecting faith. In one online thread that I read recently, the question was posed, what is the most convincing argument for atheism and how would you respond to it? And someone replied, and I quote, I don't believe in God, I don't have an argument, I don't need an argument, I don't believe in God, end quote. Now, I, I've known some very intelligent people indeed who have said exactly that to me in the past, that they've not offered any arguments, they've simply refused to offer any justifications. They, they said for them, God just doesn't exist, it's not an issue for them, they don't need arguments, they claim, it just doesn't exist. And, and this is their reason for atheism and um, that, that for me is the most curious thing because it means you don't have to in any way give a rational justification for your worldview so it's controversial but how would you respond to that this kind of goes back to <clears throat> what i mentioned initially the default state of being a skeptic but also a psychological disorder so so many former muslims people who become murtad they leave the fold of islam mm. they tend to have emotional issues so right the the Mulvi in the mosque may have beaten them with a stick while they were learning the Quran, so they associate that with Islam. Some people may come from a misogynistic background, mm. um, um, women who were badly treated by their husbands or their parents, and then they associate that with Islam. Uh, so many of the former Muslims and atheists may have actual emotional, deep emotional issues. Mm. Sigmund Freud and uh, mm. Others may have something <laughs> to say about that, but even though he himself well, was he an, an atheist, atheist yes. <clears throat> but uh, at the same time, I would say with regard to this, Islam is very simple. Mm. Islam is presented to people if it does not convince them, la ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion. If it deen, if we can translate the word ad deen as religion, because mm. religion means to bind people. Mm. Ad deen, there is no compulsion in the deen, meaning Islam. So like Rafi deen, there is no argument with such people. Mm. Where uh, the response is given is with regard to what is known as aggressive new atheism, right. belligerent <clears throat> new atheism, mm -hmm. an atheism that has uh, an aggressive approach and uses fallacious arguments against Muslims, even against Christians and other yeah. peoples of other faiths, but mainly against Muslims, misconstruing so many basic things of Islam yeah. in order to demonstrate to new, uh, to new Muslims or to uh, Western Muslims and others as well, those who are affected by globalization. Mm. So now we live in a globalized village, people affected by these types of thoughts presenting to them doubts, so our response is given to them. But if someone just takes the default position, I do not accept God, maybe over time they will overcome their emotional issues, their psychological issues. Could you mention if someone was on a plane that was uh, careering down about to, to hit the sea, the chances are, atheist or not, they're going to call out on they God. They will call on God. Despite what, they've, what I've just said, yes. because their, their fitra will be activated then, at that extreme yes. emergency. They're not just going to sit back and, oh, I don't really believe. Yes. They're, going to, they're going to grasp at anything that will save them from this, just instinctively. So that, that would be, belie their own claim, I would argue. Um, yes. But, but what I, I just wanted to, sh to share this, and uh, I shared this with you earlier, so um, there's a fascinating article in the London Times, um, and I just want to read to you a few extracts from this. This is a real eye-opener when it comes to atheists and what they actually believe, because we've been speaking about the new atheists, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and others, and these are hardcore materialists. They don't believe in anything other than, I don't know, the alleged scientifically verifiable. That's all they believe in, what's the, the scene. But most atheists, according to this Times article, believe in the supernatural, a study finds. I kid you not, and I'll, I'll read it to you. 
Uh, so this is in, in the London Times. Most atheists and agnostics believe in supernatural powers and that there are forces of good and evil, quote unquote, even though they do not necessarily believe in God, according to a new study. The Understanding Unbelief program, led by the University of Kent, here in England, interviewed thousands of people who identified as atheists and agnostics in six countries, Britain, the United States, Brazil, China, Denmark, and Japan. So it's quite a diverse global array there. The report defined atheists as people who, quote, don't believe in God and agnostics as people who, quote, don't know whether there is a God and I don't believe there is a way to find out, unquote. The researchers found that a minority of atheists and agnostics or unbelievers rejected all of the supernatural beliefs which were put to them. It found that the majority of people who did not have faith still believed in at least one aspect of the supernatural, such as life after death, reincarnation or astrology. They also sometimes believe that some events were meant to be and that, they, that, that there were forces of good and evil. Almost a third of atheists and around 40% of agnostics believe in underlying forces of good and evil compared with 60% of the general population. In total, and, and this is extraordinary, given Sam Harris and all these other atheists, 71% of atheists and 92% of agnostics held at least one supernatural belief. Now, uh, a guy called Lois Lee, he's the senior research fellow at the University of Kent's Department of Religious Studies, he said, these findings show once and for all that the public image of the atheist is a simplification at best and a gross caricature at worst, end quote. And just a, a very last sentence in the Times article, 20% of atheists believe in life after death compared to 55% of the general population. Now, what that tells me is that our, when we look at Richard Dawkins and we see his worldview as representing atheism, he's not actually representing his constituency of atheists globally, because most do believe in supernatural beings. Well, he does say that atheists are like, herding atheists is like herding wild cats, <laughs> because each atheist has his own point of view. Yeah. But Richard Dawkins, um, you have the likes of Richard Dawkins, Anthony Flew. Yeah, well, yes, he's who, not an atheist. Who became yeah. a, a yeah. deist towards that's, the end. That's right. If you look at their rhetoric prior, uh, with Anthony Flew prior to changing his position, mm. with regard to Islam, right, it's more of a cultural baggage that they mm. have. Mm. So where I quote Richard Dawkins saying he, he, he prefers the church bells to the adhan. Yeah, he's a, cultural, Allah, a cultural Christian, he says. Yeah, uh, yeah. Allah Akbar of the, uh, yeah. the... Meaning he finds the, the adhan reprehensible. Mm. He doesn't use that word, but distasteful. He finds it yeah, distasteful. Yeah. And Anthony Flew refers to Allah as a, a, cosmotic, a, co a cosmic uh, Saddam Hussein. Mm. Or he refers to uh, Islam as a Marxist, an Arab Marxism or an Arab... Uh, way of colonizing other peoples. This is how they viewed Islam. And then when you observe former Muslims, the main issue they have with Islam, I believe, is not the theology with regard to God. Because if you look at Allah, you look at the names and attributes mm, of Allah, mm, mm. it's something, uh, something that a person can accept wholeheartedly. There's no objection. Mm. There's no real mm. objection. Mm. The divine attributes, when you list the divine attribute, his existence, his opposition to the contingent, his self-subsistency, his oneness, the oneness of Allah, his being all-knowing, all-seeing, all these things. The main problem they have is Sharia law. Right. Because it constrains you mm. as a human. Yeah. So if, if someone is living a hedonistic lifestyle, a free lifestyle, and if they they believe, and also they make the, the mistake of... Thinking Islam is like Christianity, where yes. a sin takes you out of the fold of Islam. Yes, yes. So, you can be a Muslim, but sinful. Oh, yeah. yeah. But so, so many people are under the impression, if I become a Muslim, 
uh, I, well, they are obliged to do the following, but if they don't, they're just sinful, they still will not face an eternal damnation if they drink, if they do adultery, if they do all the major sins in Islam, they will, they will still save themselves from eternal damnation. Even, Why? Eventually. Eventually, yeah. because eternal yeah. damnation, mm. And this is something else because one of the objections is mm. why would God, a merciful God, punish people eternally? The answer is if you look at the punishments in hell, eternal punishment is based upon intention. Eternal punishment. Like Christopher Hitchens when he says, if I die and I meet God I still and I see God, I will not believe in him. Christopher Hitchens said that. Similarly, Stephen Fry when he says, when he's asked by the interviewer, if you, if you are brought to the pearly gates of heaven, he says, I will still uh, demonstrate against God and, um, you know, Such chastise God, chastise God for all these Such evils. Mm. So these people, they really, th those type of atheists despise Allah for being Allah. Mm -hmm. But there are so many people who fall into atheism because of the restrictions of Sharia law. Mm. Mm. And that in itself is something that they need to realize that the restrictions of Sharia law are there for your own benefit. Mm -hmm. Meaning the prohibition of alcohol. <coughs> we don't drink alcohol because if we became drunk, <coughs> we would become like animals. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> As the cause of numerous diseases in the world. Uh, and I'm sure if it was invented today, alcohol, it would be... Uh, banned as a, a class A drug <coughs> along with all the other things but because it's been around a long time it's allowed to continue to exist. Well the government benefits from the high taxes so this is true. like uh, yeah. cigarettes also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay the very last uh, uh, reason uh, given why some <coughs> people uh, believe for, uh, for rejecting faith is um, again got a quite, quite a common one um, and it's not really an argument for atheism, it's, it's kind of slightly different, but nevertheless, atheists always say it. There are so many religions and so many different gods. Why does Islam think it's the only true religion? All religions make this claim. So it's a kind of sceptical view about all religions making identical claims, therefore we can't believe in any of them. They cancel each other out, perhaps. And that's why we don't believe, I suppose. If well, if you, if you list all the religions, <coughs> Buddhism, does it have a god? No. Hinduism, does it really have a God? The answer is no. Hinduism is paganism that was scattered across India and then post-British Raj, <clears throat> it became an organized religion. Right, right, Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the north of India, you have different gods worshipped to the south of India. Right. You have, you know, Kalima and all these various gods who oppose one another. So that really cancels out those two. Mm -hmm. Then you have Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right. We won't count Sikhism because Sikhism is a later development from Hinduism and Islam and the, the clash with Islam. Mm -hmm. Judaism would be discounted because it, it has become a racial religion. Mm. So even if someone adopted Judaism, they, they will always remain a second class Jew because it's a racial religion. So it leaves only the two religions but in terms of Judaism the concept of God or how they believe in God very similar to Islam very similar yes yeah so I, those two agree on that yeah but then Christianity is man worship in essence L literally I think yes. in the case of Jesus yes so that cancels out Christianity because man worship mm. is illogical so it only gives Islam and Judaism it's and also idolatry because you're worshiping a creature yes. rather than God yeah yes yeah, so yeah. it only leaves Islam right and Judaism and between Judaism and Islam, Islam is a preservation of the true message of Islam from the time of the well, But also project. Judaism doesn't claim to be a universal religion, it's the religion of the people of Israel for, for Jews, whereas Islam does claim, you know, the Prophet Muhammad upon him said, I've been sent as a mercy to all the worlds. In other words, it's not limited to a nation or a tribe or a people, but for everything. And Judaism is a development of post Suleiman Ali Salam. So after the kingdom of Suleiman Ali Salam, one of the tribes of mm. the twelve tribes, Ju Judah, the tribe of Judah, mm. and with the the other tribe, the tribe of Aaron, they established a Ju Judaic religion, right? Which is not the teachings of Moses. No, it's not. The, so the current 
Jewish religion we have, it's not the actual teachings of Musa Right, right. So he only leaves Islam. <laughs> right, by a process of, of elimination. Elimination, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that, that's uh, all the questions uh, I have. We could go on for hours, but that's probably enough. I, I, do, I do recommend uh, th this excellent book. It does cover so much more than we could possibly cover. Um, you mentioned the Sharia very briefly. You talk in the last chapter, chapter 6, of uh, the preservation of the Quran. Uh, you talk about Sharia law, jihad, slavery, corporal punishment, capital punishment for apostates. You've got a section on that. Homosexuality in Islam, the marriage of Lady Aisha, polygamy, the hijab, um, uh, women inheritance laws, wife beating, quote unquote, women's intellect and leadership and a great deal more. So this is more than just um, a, re a rebuttal of atheism. You're tackling the kind of objections that most, not most people, that many people uh, would have in the West based on um, what you would say, I'm sure, is misunderstandings about Islam itself. So it's a very comprehensive book. Um, and it's actually very well written and quite readable. So I, I, rec I wouldn't normally recommend books unless they were readable. Well, this could be really boring, but this one is readable. So I do recommend that, inshallah. And thank you very much Just indeed, Sheikh, for your time. It's been an absolute Likewise. pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Likewise. Till next time. Thank you.